Sadam Yogi San Yoginis. Hello, hello, and welcome back to one more part in this mantra course. You were wondering whether it was finished after chanting the whole alphabet? Well, probably you didn't because you could see in the playlist there was one more. Or maybe you did. Maybe you thought, that's it. We chanted it all. That's all about it, isn't it? Well, not. We haven't explored the meaning of sounds. We did that with the semi-vowels and we did that with the uh, vowels as well. But we haven't done that with the consonants. So... I am very happy to go now into some kind of philosophical exploration into the meaning of the different sounds on the consonants that we have taken so long to go through the upper palate and the points and mapping them and what does it do in the hypothalamus, pituitary, pineal and so on. But we haven't explored the actual meaning of the sounds from a linguistic perspective. So for that, we're going to go back to this uh, wonderful little book that I really enjoy very much reading and I have been rereading and taking notes uh, for preparing for this course and I recommend everyone to get your copy Gods in the Word Archetypes in the Consonants by Mar Mar Margaret Magnus I will uh, leave a uh, um, little link in the description of this video below so you can have the, the book for yourself but also uh, Margaret, Margaret Magnus has a website in which she talks about this book and some of the research that she has done. And she even includes a copy of her PhD, which is fascinating, but it's huge material. And um, my interest it is not to go so very much in depth into language the way she does. I find it fascinating and it's wonderful. Uh, but I will not going to use that, uh, that document as a reference for what we are going to be talking in these videos. Because I find it a bit overwhelming when you're going into analyzing every little sound of every word in the English language. It's just an incredible task what she has accomplished. But anyway, this little book is fantastic. So we're going to take it and start exploring the different sounds, starting with the gutturals, the G, the G and the K. And if you remember from the Sanskrit alphabet, we have the we know where they were being vibrated. Here we have the last uh, of the drawings that we have been using so much. We are doing these gutturals, ka, ka, ga, ganga, vibrating around the area of the throat. We know the throat is the fifth chakra with the visas and hum, but these are the sounds that we are going to be interested about. Remember that ka, ka, ga, ganga, these are five sounds. Nga is one of the five uh, different kind of uh, four different kinds of ends that we have in in uh, Sanskrit, and mainly we're going to be focusing on the K and the G. We know that K is um, non-voiced, we call it, and G is a voiced sound. The difference between a non-voiced and a voiced is simply that in the voiced sounds. So that means all of these sounds on the right, the vocal cord or vocal fold, it's actually not really like a cord, but more like a fold, the vocal fold is vibrating. And in the non-voiced, it is not vibrating. So ba and pa, you can, if you touch, uh, if you put the hand in the, on the throat, if you, with your fingers, you do pa 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 pa. The a uh is vibrating because that's a vowel, but the you will not feel it vibrate, but you will feel it vibrate. So the same with the K and the G. With the K, there should be no vibration. There should be a vibration. So that's the difference between non-voiced and voiced. These are the non-voiced, these are the voiced. And we're going to see what Margaret Magnus has to say about the K and the G, and she has a lot to say about it. So let's let's go into it. First, she, she does mention a little bit about other alphabets, like the Japanese, and there's the Irish tree language, and some other things, like the runes. Um, just I will just explore a little bit the Hebrew alphabet of the Kabbalah. She talks about this G sound, in relation to nature, the throat, everything that is hollow and profound, an opening, outlet, canal, organic covering, 
and also the high priestess. And the K forms every subject that is hollow, the half closed hand of man, half closed hand of man, yeah? Reflections and assimilation, reflections, eh? And assimilation. We will we will see about these things a little bit later on. A mold which receives and communicates all forms indifferently. Analogy: the wheel of fortune. So, a form which, uh, a mold which receives and communicates all forms indifferently. And this aspect of being hollow, like the half closed hand. Well, this is considered to be. Uh, from a yogic perspective, the only hollow part of the body, because if you look at the, the lungs, when they are in full exhalation, they are collapsed. When you inhale, they fill with blood and oxygen, yeah? But when you exhale, they are collapsed. So they are not like, they don't hold the, the position and they are empty. The same with the stomach, when you, it's empty, it's just collapsed, it, it doesn't get filled with air. Uh, so the only part of the body which is hollow and empty is the trachea, which has uh, like the um, uh, cartilag, cartilag, which holds the position and there's emptiness inside. So when we do meditations on the void, uh, particularly, for example, if you're doing a healing with Sananda Sayan and you are trying to invoke the void in you to, to sort of to help deal with some particular resistance that is not being resolved, uh, you need to bring this void for some reason, you can call upon the energy of the throat because that's the emptiness, well, that's where the emptiness comes from. So it's interesting. Also in the way we talk about how uh, the world is created, we were saying that is at the first there is nothing and then something hits the nothing and then out of that everything comes out and everything happens. And that everything is the word, everything resonates, everything vibrates, that's the om, yeah, the pranava. So that is happening here in the very throat, yeah? There is nothing, and then there is vibration, and then sound comes out of it. So, let's see, let's explore. We're going to see um, her, Margaret Magnus, talk about the K sound. This is like a, a summary, a very short summary of the K, and it talks about this container with an opening. So not just the, not just the hand that is slightly open, but it's also closed. It has a, a closing on top. The opening most often has a cover. K-shape is consequently curved, corner, or crinkly. Yeah? I mean, this opening and the cover, this is, I take some notes here in the book, this is like swallowing, yeah? Something gets into the throat, and we have a mechanism here in which we have to decide whether we're going to swallow it or we're going to throw it out. So this is the point in which there is a this kind of like a physical instinctive decision of whether something is going to go out or is going to go in. That's the area where we pronounce the G and the K. So it says here that it, its sister, the G, has a hidden side, just like the K, but K is more secretive, mysterious, is closer, more socially aware. Uh, I, I think she... With this description, she's kind of being metaphorical and like the way these sounds inspire her. But then when you read her description of the many sounds that K appear in the different words, or the many words in which K appear, let's say, then that's how she's, out of those words, she's getting this characterization of the letter, of the sound of letter, as a hidden side and secretive and mysterious. We will see more about this. Things come to and are collected in the container. Yeah? And uh, here are those who are intimate with, with one another. They are the kings, the clans, and the clubs, and the covens who share a secret knowledge. That's very interesting. Eh? The kings, and the clans, and the clubs, and the covens. They exhibit kindness towards one another, but the container serves not only to keep some things in, but also serves to keep things out. And the upper echelons of K exhibit unfeeling cruelty, cruelty towards the commoners, the clowns and klutzes whom they shut out. So K is like a cutting sound, yeah? K, K, K. When you do the K sound, it's like cutting and it cuts out what is not going to be allowed to go inside. And what is allowed inside? Those who are the kings or part of the class, no? 
or of these classes and clubs and covens. So that's very interesting in the sense that who has the words? If we look at India, and uh, traditionally we were in the very first video of this mantra course, I talked about how in the caste system of India, only those in the higher caste would have access to the knowledge. The knowledge is the wisdom. The wisdom comes in the words, in form of words. Yeah, Who has the knowledge, who has the, the, the teachings, is the one who has the power. And you can use the teaching as a, as a power. This is the very reason why in the old times uh, in, in Christianity, they would just uh, do the sermons in Latin. And then the people in the town, they would not understand anything of what the priest was saying. And so they are powerless. Yeah, things have changed a lot. Now the priest is speaking in, in your own language and then now you understand. But keeping the, the knowledge uh, for yourself is keeping the power. So uh, only the higher caste, the, the Brahmins, would have access to the, the teachings, the Vedas and the different teachings in Sanskrit. So when they say they are the kings, the clans, the clubs, yeah, the covens, it's saying like the word was being kept secret and, and it's a mystery of what this word is about. And we are practicing Kundalini Yoga and um, Kriya Yoga, uh, these kind of uh, Raja Yogas, yeah? These Yogas, they are Yoga of Kings. Raja it means king or queen. And uh, when we are practicing Raja Yoga or, or Kundalini Yoga, the idea is that you want to crown yourself. You don't want to expect anyone to crown you. You have to chant the mantras and you have to crown yourself. By chanting the mantras, the Kundalini awakens and goes to your crown. That is the crowning. That's becoming a king or a queen. And that's why in the Sikh Dharma, uh, all, the, all the men inherit this, this, this uh, name of Singh, like lions, like, like royal lions. And the women inherit the core. Core would be princess. So again, like crowning yourself. The idea is this, that we can crown ourselves. I'm utilizing this case, sound very consciously case of the crown, yeah, the, the kings and the queens. And, and it's about this something royal in it. And that's having access to your own words. And your words matter. Your words have meaning. Words being the fifth chakra, yeah, ka -ka 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 -ka, vibrating here. So this is what she said about the K. And let's explore the G. G centers around the motion to and from a void. So uh, giving, getting and going in the context of something invisible and vast. This void of the throat would also imply something vast and invisible. Very many G words concern too much where it doesn't belong associated with a gunky or grotesque feeling. Another large class concerns privation and its association with an experience of vast emptiness or loss. So this void can also connect to emptiness, but also privation, like you, you haven't had access to that because the, the door is closed. Yeah, We said this, there is a gate which decides what goes in or what does not in. And that's the fifth chakra. It's like a filter. It's like a gate, which in those the video where we were, I was talking about Kechari Mudri, I was talking about how we utilize the tongue to open this gate, to allow the flow of Amrit, yeah? But the gate is there. So there's also a beautiful class of G-words which hits the balance and conveys grandeur and unlimited bounty, God, grace, goodness, growth, and gladness. The Holy Grail. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a minute. The sources and destinations of G are mysterious and hidden. Things simply grow from the ground or go into the grave. Yeah, so it's coming out or going inwards, yeah? Coming out or growing inwards. Just like something we can swallow or we can live out. Very much like our words. We can swallow our words and not say something. And, or we can let them out and allow our words to be like seeds for somebody else, yeah? Which, by the way, seeds, seeds, you know, the, the, word, the words are like seeds. The, the, the culmination of all our understanding, our, our wisdom is our words and they can be like seeds that plant get planted into somebody else and now if they nurture nurture them if they nourish them these seeds can become beautiful flowers and trees by themselves yeah somebody tells me something maybe my teacher says a word that word can go inside and it can flourish into a beautiful tree uh, 
uh, like a seat of consciousness that is set, in, set inside and then I can water it with my reflection, with my meditation, or I can just reject it and ignore it, yeah? But the words have this power that they become like seeds. We talked a little bit about Bija mantras, yeah? Like seeds. But this just reminded me, I talked about the, in how in the, in the Kabbalah, uh, the K meant this aspect of the emptiness and the, 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 the something open, some container. But um, in the, in the Aristri alphabet, it's interesting how K is related to nuts, yeah? Uh, with a hard shell, so concentrated knowledge. It's just what we were talking about. And the G is just related to harvest and resurrection, yeah? I mean, resurrection, every time somebody reads uh, the Jabji, Guru Nanak is alive. Yeah, his words are alive. And, uh, and that's the harvest. Yeah, that's gathering the seeds from the words. So the history alphabet relates the K and the G to this aspect of resurrection and harvesting and getting the seeds out and, and, um, and the concentrated knowledge. I mean, the seed, what is the seed? A seed is in, in, is like, has the potential to become a big tree, a big oak. It's contained within a little acorn. So it's all the knowledge of the oak is concentrated in a little tiny nut. And that's the K and the G. It's, isn't it incredible? I find it incredible. To me, it, it's really, wow, when, I, when I'm reading these things, it, it, it really leaves me in a state of awe. And so I, that's why I'm sharing it with you. So hopefully you are also being touched. Otherwise, you would not be watching these videos, I guess, right? So uh, things coming out and things going inwards, yeah? It can grow from the ground or go into the grave. It's about giving or about uh, getting and going, receiving. We will see more about this giving and receiving a little bit farther away. But yeah, this is the gateway of what goes out or what doesn't go out, yeah? It says, uh, now you can look at this. This is the fifth chakra, number five, drawn in this way. You can see here, this is very much like the yin yang, isn't it? This is from Karam Kriya, from Shin Charan Singh. Um, we explore numbers. And number five reflects this aspect of yin and yang. We can see it here in the throat. And this yin and yang can be seen in this aspect of, of giving or getting. Yeah? Give, giving or getting, giving or receiving. Yeah? And it says that there is also a connection with light. Light is reflected and glasses and 17% uh, of the words are intimately associated with the body part into which things disappear, the galet. 17% of the words, yeah, the G common words, are related to the galet, like gazel, gobel, gargle, goiter, gofo. Gafo? I don't know some of these words actually myself. <laughs> uh, there's many words that uh, she mentions and I, I feel so ignorant about the English language, but um, uh, they are connected to the galet. So in Spanish, we call it garganta. Garganta, throat in English is garganta, which is a lot of g and r sound, yeah? So that's it. That's a summary of the K and the G. But there is much more in this little book that she talks about. And she says how... Um, all right, so... Uh, sorry, let, let's... Let's, let's, uh, let's cover this other area. I was going to mention something else. But she says how that's, that's just the G, but then it goes with other sounds. And when you put them together, it can go into one direction or it can go in another direction. So uh, she mentions, for example, that an example of a phonesteme. Yeah, phonesteme is a combination, a combination of phonemes. Like, for example, G and L. So L, remember, this is the Bija sound for the first chakra, lam, 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 yeah? So when you put G and L together, you have shining, mostly reflected or indirected light. And it's quite incredible. I'll, uh, look at all these words which are connected. Glare, gleam, gleam, glimmer, glint, glisten, glisten, glitter, glitter, gloaming, glow. 
all these things are in some way yeah, shining and mostly reflected or indirected light. And that is the G linked to the L, yeah, which, you know, the L as light, yeah, and this G. Okay, so far so good. So some classes for GL are related to, la to uh, light are also GL as looking, usually indirectly, so glancing, glaring, glazed, glimpse, glint, clover, and reflected surfaces like a glacier or a glare or a glass, yeah, gloss. So just to give you a sense of how general this is, these three GL classes we just looked at, yeah, the shining reflected light, the glaring, the looking, and the reflected uh, surfaces, these three GL classes contain over half of the common words which begin with GL, GL which no prefixes or suffixes. Eh? Half of the words that start with GL are reflected in this, in this way, in these three different meanings. So this is, this is mainly what she, what she did in her work. She looked at all the words and she started to classify them according to what function do they take and how do they uh, connect to each other. Let's go somewhere else. Now, this is where she uh, takes the G and makes an in-depth study of the G. She doesn't do it with every letter, so uh, we are also not going to do it with every letter. But it's good to see how deep does she go with just one particular letter. She does it with the P and the B and with the S as well. We will cover that in future uh, parts of this course. But uh, let's look at the G. She calls it the grail. Yeah. So the consonant G centers are about getting and giving, greed and generosity. Yeah. So it contains two major semantic classes, too much where it doesn't belong and not enough where you need it. This is kind of like the yin and yang. Yeah. So let's see what she means by this too much and not enough. So too much would be gala, galore, glaring, glad, gops, google and gross. In terms of greed, golem, greed, gascon, uh, gluttony, gol, gargle, glutton, yeah? You can read them yourself. I cannot pronounce all of, all of it. Some of them, I'm not sure how to pronounce them. But you, the ones I identified, it really connects very much with this sense, yeah, of gluttony too much, wanting to grab too much, yeah? Grabbing, grasping, gripping, yeah? Gooey, something gooey, yeah? Which is something kind of, it can, it can be a little bit disgusting, the G, yeah? Um, glop, glop, gop, go, goo, goop, yeah? Gore, gunk, garbage, yeah? Again, goo, glop, goop, gout, cock. Gimmicks, like gadgets and gambits and game. Gloss, unpleasant, like gross, yeah. <laughs> All right, so. That's all in connection to this GUI. There was, we were seeing that too much. Um, she says that uh, this, this concept of too much and not enough is 41% of the G words and tends to be associated with a gross or gaudy feeling tone. Yeah. So this is the ones we are seeing. Too much talk, gobble, gum, gargle, gas, glip, gossip, too much laughter, like gag, gas, giggle. Too much staring, like gape, gasping, gazing, glaring. Too much enthusiasm, too much anguish. So too much, too much, too much, yeah? An excess of some way. And conversely, she says we have another 34% of the words for things that are gone. And, and look, if you look at the percentages of this, 41% and 34 so it's like the majority, the greatest majority of, of words are reflected into these categories that she is... Uh, making here. So things for, that are gone, which are associated with grieving or empty, yeah? Not enough, like gaunt or ghetto. Death, like the gallows, gangrene, garrote, grave, grief, yeah? Ghost, ghastly and goals, and glooming, like glower and glum, yeah? Gaps, yeah? They reflect an emptiness, yeah? A gap, 
Gulch. Empty talk. Remember when we were doing too much talk? Empty talk. Like gabble or garble or glip or gloss or gossips. Empty stare. It's funny how gossip, for example, it can be both into too much and it can be uh, too much talk, yeah? Too much talking about emptiness, about nothing. Yeah, gossiping is like talking too much about nothing. That's really very much as a link to this chakra and this word. Empty stares, like gazing and gaping. Also drags, yeah, which are often taken to, to try to fill up a void that we feel inside, yeah? Gimmicks, goof, greed, gluttony, grab. So again, there is something that we feel is missing and we try to put something into it or we try to compensate by talking too much or eating too much or laughing too much or stirring too much. Greed and all those concepts. She also mentions how there is a, diff a beautiful class of G words which end in a dental sound which helps to balance it, to balance particularly this, this uh, gaudy or gross feeling. And when you add this, lit, this dental sound at the end, then uh, the, the G reveals as grandeur, like glad, glory, God, good, grace, grand, grand and grateful. And this balance is other, in other words, which the, the dental sound as D can be more softer, like you remember the, the R of Guru can can be pronounced in the same point as D. It's only that the tongue is not touching fully. That's why it's a semi-vowel. But Guru is a good example. But we find also guest and guide and grail and grain and ground and groom and gala and gold and so very many, yeah? In which this, fa finally, the D sound is kind of making it softer and finding things more into balance. And when you find the balance, you find the gold. And who, find, who helps you find the balance? That's the guru, the gateway to God. So, gateway to God, yeah? Gateway to God. <laughs> to God. <laughs> Trying to play around with the sounds as well. But uh, look, uh, she just included quite a few of the G words. And, and these 221 she just included are 67% of the whole. It's incredible, huh? And they can be into these clear categories. categories. And she says, well, the, you, could, you could think that this is just um, a coincidence and that, for example, the grotesque of the G, you could find it in many other letters. But actually, if you, if you follow the book and you explore it, that's not the case. And she says, well, look, uh, if you have the B sound, you find more in terms of badness and bullying in the D sound is more like dirt and darkness and dreariness, but in the, the grotesque is something reserved for the G. And uh, that to me is fascinating, this connection of G with these terms. And of course, if somebody had a G in their name, then this would be reflected. And uh, it's... Um, it could be useful also to reflect upon these mantras which contain the G sound. And particularly there's one word that is very significant and we need to mention, and it's the word of God. Because God uh, is something, she also reflects upon this word a little bit. And she says how God is an example of an English word which suffered many hard knocks over the centuries. And uh, there is a lot of, you know, association to the word and he has been sold in some way as the you know this man in the clouds with a long beard judging us, and um, and we have resented that image of God, and now we try to pull away from it, and by pulling away we pull away from the word itself, and so she also mentions how um, going through a personal crisis the word well, now we are trying to get out of it by and not using it and systematically replacing it with other words like the Tao or cosmos or nature or let's call it cosmic consciousness or universal consciousness or the primary intelligence or the energy in the cosmos. Or We use so very many words 
to describe something which is really God. <laughs> it's just that we don't want it associated to the old way. We have learned how it how it's associated and we want to try to get away. But by getting away from the actual word of God, we are losing something precious, like the grail, right? Grail, grail, the grail. So um, Joseph Campbell claims that the ultimate word in our language for that which is transcendent is God. And she also mentions, Nietzsche, Nietzsche said this very famous sentence, God is dead. And you could understand this to be true if what Nietzsche talked when he talked about God is saying that the word God is dead because we are trying to get away from it. Yeah. So why not use God? <laughs> why not use the word? And, and I understand. Personally, I, I had a very, very tough challenge with this word and trying to get away from this idea of this little man in the clouds this fantasy that is judging us and we should feel guilty and ashamed about it and mea culpa and so on. And I tried to avoid this word for a very long time. To me, the word God felt like too big for my mouth and I couldn't get it through my mouth. And I remember teaching yoga for years before one day I finally said enough. <laughs> And I remember going to the class, which was actually in a gym. It wasn't even a yoga center. It was in a gym. And there I went and I said, today we're going to talk about God. <laughs> and I just said it. Let's talk about God. <laughs> God. <laughs> and uh, I'm almost crying and laughing because it was so funny. Because I had never said that word for years and, and the students were kind of a little bit shocked. <laughs> I came so strongly. And, and yeah, and we chanted this mantra that we have in Kundalini Yoga, God and me, me and God are one. And, um, and yeah, I, I remember like overcoming a big barrier. Yeah, B barrier. We'll see about the B later on and the barrier that it means. That's very interesting. But uh, we are in the G right now, the K and the G. Okay. G, <laughs> let's go, <laughs> let's go. All right, uh, I'm getting excited, so <laughs> let's calm down a little bit. I want to point out another thing. The mantra ekonkar, yeah? Ek, there is the contraction of the K, and that's happening in the, in the throat. And remember, the sound vibrates and starts in the throat. The beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word is God, and God is in the word, God is in our throats, yeah? Remember God, the word, G-O-D, generating, organizing, destroying, and how your words can generate, can organize, or can destroy. Just like generate, can a seed be planted into the, somebody's consciousness by a word that you say, and 20 years later they can come to you and say, you know that, say, that thing you said that was incredible, it changed my life, and you're like... I said that, I don't even remember, but it was like a seed that was planted in their consciousness. The same way, organize and destroy. You can say a word and it can be so destructive that nothing else can heal that wound and that relationship is broken for life. That can happen very easily. We have to be super conscious of our words because God is in them, right? So, ik, the K contracting. Ong, om expanding, ong, but the ong, the G contracting back. Ik, ik, ong. And then car, against the, again the K, but the R expands the sound forward. We didn't look at about this, about the letter R, when we were looking at the semi vowels, but we may explore it more in combination with other sounds. And we will see with the B or the K. Okay, we already seen it, but maybe with another letter, because this video is already getting long. How R tends to expand the sound while other sounds tend to cut it, right? So the car is like this contraction of the K, now it's expanded. So it's ek, on, car. And then sat, nam, again, sat, nam, again. So there is this constant ebbing and flowing and coming and going, of, you know, coming in and coming out, which is very much associated to the throat. Remember, giving and receiving. And this giving and receiving and coming in and out and ebb and flow reminds me also of a very, very famous mantra now, not from the Kundalini yoga tradition, but actually from Morashiva's tradition. And that's the Gayatri Mantra. 
Om bur buvasva tat savitur varenyam bargo devasya dimahi diyo yo na prachodayat. Om bur buvasva, sometimes it's described as this ebbing and flowing, like the, the tides coming in and coming out. And if you chant this mantra looking at the horizon, you can see the energy coming in and coming out, yeah? And you can feel the, the, the communing with the nature and the prana crossing through the barrier of your skin and in and out, in and out. And as you inhale and exhale, feeling the energy coming in and coming out. That's a, a, a nice feeling that is reflected upon these sounds. Let's uh, just uh, before closing the video, let's chant God and Mimi and God are one a few minutes just to get into contact with the word God. And if you are afraid of it, if you are traumatized by it, if you have something in you that has felt a challenge to say the word, just allow yourself to explore it. It's just sound, just explore it for a moment, just say it out loud and see if we can heal the wounds that we have associated to this very sacred word. Whatever it means to you, whatever you relate to it as a primary intelligence or a cosmic consciousness, it has a word. The word is God. So, let's just try it for a few moments. Close your eyes. God and me, me and God are one. 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 Hell. We will continue in the next part of this course exploring the following consonants in the alphabet. We may not go so deep as we went with this one. It depends. We will see what is to come. But until then, Satnam, take care. Thank you very much.